You are about to hear a telephone conversation between a man and a woman about a rental property. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Central Realty, Jill speaking. How can I help you? Yes, hello Jill. I've got a problem, a complaint I wish to register. Who should I speak to? You'll want to speak to Tracy, the residential manager. Just a moment and I'll put you through. Thanks. Hello, this is Tracy. I understand your rent is going to be increased. Yes, this is why I'm calling. I was told that my rent would not be increased for the length of my six-month contract, which I signed only four months ago. What's going on? Is my landlord allowed to do this? I see. Yes. Okay. That seems strange. Look, can I take down some of your particulars and I'll register a formal complaint to the landlord on your behalf? Yes, sure. That'd be good. Firstly, name and address contact details. Yes, Jane McSweeney. That's M-C-S-W-E-E-N-Y. 3 Mauger Street. That's M-A-U-G-H-E-R Street. Windery, 3355. And the phone there? Yes, you can contact me on 334756, extension 3176. I generally arrive home by 6 o'clock in the evening, so you can call me around that time, but not after 9. Oh, sorry, 8.30, because that's the time I leave for work. Okay, so I should note down that the problem is that your landlord wants to raise your rent. And when did you first move in? Yes, well, the contract began on August 1st, and... Oh, hang on. Sorry, that's the ending date. We actually moved in on February the 1st. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay. Good. Now, if need be, you will have to send a letter to the Rental Tenancy Board. But as I said, first let us approach your landlord on your behalf and see if we can work out the problem before it gets to that situation. I'd be very surprised if you have to send the letter. 95% of these kinds of problems get solved early on. Okay. Now, if you have any problems you need to discuss, feel free to come in and talk with the general manager. In the meantime, if you would just wait until we receive an answer from your landlord, we'll be able to then plan our next step. Is there anything else I could be doing? Well, you could write a letter to the RTB listing all the events as they happened from your point of view. But as I say, hold on to it. Don't send it unless we have to. Well, that's about it for now. Thanks for your call. I'm sure we can sort this out. Thanks very much for your help. I hope we can sort it out too. Bye for now. Yes, bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about a job vacancy. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Top Job Employment Agency. Ellen Sykes speaking. How can I help you? Good morning. My name's Steve Collins and I'm calling about the call centre job advertised in today's paper. For an operative handling credit card inquiries? Yes, that's right. The wages and working conditions are all in the ad, so what I'd like to know now is what the work actually consists of. I should explain that I'm a student looking for a summer job, not long-term employment. That's OK. The people at Intercard say they've always found students to be honest, which of course is essential in this line of work, and they have the basic IT skills needed there. Apparently, there have been a few who didn't find it easy to get there on time in the morning, but in most cases, their punctuality is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, about the work. And I know a bit about this, because, as it happens, I've worked there myself. Really? Yes, for about a year. You'd find that most callers would be people wanting to check the balance on their cards, query payments made and so on. And from those who've had their cards stolen? No, they ring another number for that, an emergency line. People also call that number if they lose their cards. And what are most callers like? I mean, what kind of people are they? All sorts, really. All ages, every kind of background. Though one definite trend is the change in the number of women. Nowadays, they make up around 55% of the total, whereas years ago, there used to be a majority of men calling. At one time, I heard, as many as three quarters of all credit cards were actually held by men, but that must have been long before I was there. It's certainly different now. So to do this job, what sort of experience do I need? None, really. Have you got a credit card yourself? Yes, I have. Then you probably know quite a bit about them already. And as a student, you're obviously intelligent, which of course you need to be for the job. So after a day or so working with an experienced operative, I'm sure you'll have picked up enough to deal with routine inquiries, which of course most of them are. But there are bound to be questions I can't deal with, at least at first, what happens then? In that case, you can ask a supervisor. They're very helpful to new staff. I think I like the sound of this. What do I do next? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Can you get over there for 9.45 on Monday morning for an interview? Definitely, yes. Whereabouts are they? In Riverside Business Park. Do you know it? Yes, I've been there once. How do you usually travel? By bus. Right. So you take either the 136 or 137 to the bus station... And when you come out of there, you turn right. Along Orchard Road, that is. The road from the railway station? Yes, that's right. You go past the petrol station next to the car dealers, then carry on down the road. Do I take the first left at the main car park? Well, you could do that and walk up Newfield Avenue alongside the shopping centre, but it's a long way round. I'd suggest continuing along Orchard Road with the water company and then the insurance offices on your right. They used to be local government offices, by the way. Yes, I remember those. And you keep going until you reach the advertising agency. Now, facing that is a small road called Cherry Lane. There's a newspaper office on the corner, and opposite that is a big hotel, so you can't miss it. And how far down that road is it? Well, they aren't actually in Cherry Lane. You walk as far as the next junction and turn right into Armand Drive at the mail centre. Intercard is in the third building on the right between the airline offices and the shipping company. Fine. I'll be there on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye.
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university student and a librarian about using the city archives. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 24. Hello. I was wondering if you could give me some information about using the archives? I'd be happy to. Are you a resident of the city? Actually, I live just outside the city, but I study at the university downtown. That's fine. All you need to do is show your university identification card and you can use the archives at no charge, as long as your ID card is current, of course. Yes, it's valid. So I don't have to pay anything? No, city residents pay an annual fee, but students can use the archives for free. Everyone else needs to get special permission from the director, but that doesn't apply to you, of course. Oh, good. I was also wondering about the schedule. I have classes every day, Monday through Friday, and I also have a part-time job, so I could really only use the archives on weekends. That's not a problem at all. We're open all weekend. Actually, the only day we're closed is Monday, so you can come any day, Tuesday through Sunday. Are you open in the evenings? Yes, we're open from 9.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the evening. That will fit my schedule well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Is there something else I can help you with? Yes. One thing I'll be needing to see for one of my class projects is old photographs. Do you have photographs of the city in the 19th century that I could look at? Yes, we store all the photographs in the basement. Those stairs over there will take you down to the photography collection. Just tell the librarian there what you're interested in and he'll help you. Those would be 19th century photographs? Yes, the entire collection is there. Now, if you're interested in seeing documents from the 19th century, those are right here on the ground floor. I would like to see some of those documents. Does that collection include newspapers too? No, all the newspapers from the earliest ones in the 18th century up to the current time are on the second floor. Here, let me just give you this map of the archives and you'll be able to find whatever it is you need. Thank you. Oh, I see you have a whole room devoted to maps. Yes, on the third floor. That's great, because one thing I need to do is look at how the city has developed over time. I'm sure you'll find a lot of helpful information there. Of course, some of the maps are several centuries old so generally visitors are only allowed to see photographic reproductions of them. That shouldn't be a problem. What's this on the fourth floor, Ogden's Woolen Mill? 
As I'm sure you know, Ogden's woolen mill was the major entity responsible for the growth of this city in the 19th century. The Ogdeneers gave money for the archives to devote an entire floor to information about the history of the mill. Will I be able to find information about the Ogden family there? Photographs, personal papers, things like that? Probably the family photographs are stored downstairs in the photography collection. The personal papers would be on the fifth floor, where we keep all the personal papers of famous residents of our city. Thank you so much for your help. I'll be able to do a lot of my research here. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Test 5. Section 4. You will hear a wildlife expert giving a talk to a group of bird lovers in the UK about a species called the tawny owl. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So, what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes. The tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, 
The owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet, woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanized landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds, so there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximize their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometers. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the natural. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.